Ladies and gentlemen, the weekend warrior. Spider-Man Lotus was one of the worst things I've seen this year. And I'm fucking seeing Indiana Jones. Of course, I'm holding out for the top G and friends to take the top spot. I kind of feel bad for her now because she's supposed to be the star of the sequel and now she has to share. And she's not even in the fucking center. Look how sad her face is. Like, goddamn, just put her out of her misery. How long will you play Captain Marvel for? I don't know. I don't know. Does anyone want me to do it again? Don't be so modest. I don't know. I really don't know. I don't have the answer to that. I understand that this movie's budget was minuscule compared to what a proper Spider-Man movie doesn't prevent me from saying, bruh, the fuck was that? <laughs> the closest thing I could compare this to is The Room. And I feel that's an insult to the fine institution that is The Room. Because at least I had enjoyment with The Room. This was just, mm, what is this? What is this movie about? Okay, Spider-Man whines for like two hours. <laughs> that's basically the fucking movie. I think there was a good idea here, but the execution is terrible like a failed hanging or a beheading where the slash doesn't really quite finish off the job. This is also an accurate depiction of what it's like to watch Spider-Man Lotus. That's not to say there weren't any good things about the movie. What was good about it? Uh, what it, The budget of the film was 100k and I think the bulk of it went to the CGI because the CGI in the beginning and at the end is very good. I don't have anything bad to say about it. I did like some of the clever cuts they had in the movie to, you know, maximize the lack of budget. So in the scene, Spider-Man is hanging upside down. So instead of uh, making a prop, the webbing prop, they zoom in so that Spider-Man's just hanging, but you don't see the webbing. So the actor is probably upside down with a pull-up bar. And then in the cut, he just goes down, removing the need to make a webbing prop. Okay, this was in my notes. Now that I'm editing the footage, I see here fucking white rope. So I'm still gonna give credit to the movie for this because when it was playing in real time, I didn't notice the rope. It's still good use of it, honestly. I wanted to say that, oh, the rope should have like what, cotton feel to it, like spider webs. But I see the shooters online and they're just like, what, white rope? So I can't really shit on the movie for this. Or here with the VFX for the shocker's beams and it hits the wall. So after the beam hits, there's a quick cutaway. You don't see the crater that is formed because of the shocker beams. Good cutaways. It makes sense. That's all the good things I'm going to say about this fucking movie. Okay, so fun fact about this fight scene. Spider-Man can tank hits, you know, because I guess he's Spider-Man. But what about human people? Ordinary people? I guess we'll never know. The biggest problem this movie has- oh wait. The biggest problem this movie has is the poor execution and the storytelling. Spider-Man Lotus is based on two comics, Spider-Man Blue and The Kid Who Collects Spider-Man. There was a good idea here, but they really did not tell this story well. It's a mistake, especially for the latter, and I want to talk about that when we get to the relevant part because I think most of the movie, the bulk of it, is Spider-Man Blue, an adaptation of it, a spin-off of it. So the setup for Spider-Man Blue is that Spider-Man is feeling, well, blue because it's Valentine's Day and he's reminded of his lost love, Gwen Stacy. The framing device used by the comic book is the speech bubbles, the, the box, where it's blue and it's a narration of his thoughts to a tape recorder. Well, I'm not quite sure where I should start. And after that, it's basically a flashback to this happy moment in time where Peter Parker fell in love and how this relationship blossomed. And what's important is, while the whole comic book is a flashback to that important moment in time, the speech bubbles are still blue. So there is this overwhelming sense of nostalgia, of melancholy that permeates throughout this comic book. And even when we get to the present, it's still blue, except when we see a picture of Peter Parker and Gwen Stacy. 
Lotus more or less gets the formula of Spider-Man having a friend group, Spider-Man being in love with Gwen, but they miss the most important part, which is building that relationship. So the friend group interaction is okay. I believe that they're friends. What the film asks of me after this whole sequence where I could have spent our entire lives without getting tired of hearing your voice. Spider-Man is angstily telling us how much he misses Gwen and how he should have asked her to marry him and all that shit. We transition into the opening credits where it's basically the fight between Goblin and Spider-Man after Goblin kills Gwen. You know, after Gobby gets a dick and we cut to the cemetery. Peter is in tears. And then this happens. Your Aunt May called and Jonah and Robbie. What are you doing here? What do you want? Worried about you, Peter. You're worried about me? Yes. I'm trying to recall when I've ever seen you worry about anything. Peter, don't get mad at me for trying to help. You're not trying to help. Yes, I know I better am. than most. You never cared about that. I, I came by to see if you wanted to go to a party or something. Party? To clear your mind. You're a joke. What? I knew you couldn't handle it. Couldn't handle what? Not being the center of attention just for a second. The life of the party loses her spotlight and doesn't know what to do with herself. That's not true. It is true. You're so unaware of yourself, it's not even funny. You don't care about people like me and Gwen. She didn't live life like it was a constant game. Maybe if you took a second to think, you could have learned a thing or two from her. The movie is going for the grief angle where Peter is lashing out against everyone for the loss of Gwen. The problem is that I don't have any context for what Peter is saying. I didn't see the relationship between MJ and Peter build up or how it is before the movie started or how the friend group became this. The four of us had that rare bond you only get to experience and see every so often. Okay, movie, whatever. Peter lashes out at MJ, and I don't know where this is coming from. So he just comes across as an asshole. I know in the comic books that Peter lashed out against Mary Jane after Gwen Stacy died. I know some of the lore, not all of it. But even if I am a Spider-Man fan, I can still say that this is bad from a storytelling perspective. Since I don't have context, I don't care. If you want me to empathize with Peter, you have failed. If anything, I feel sorry for Mary Jane. And this continues later on in the film. We find out Harry disappeared and I also still don't give a fuck. I thought we could get past our differences and I thought we understood each other, but we don't. Oh, Harry has a problem. If only they established that earlier through some story building friendship moment and not just dumped it like bad exposition. Lots of tell don't show in this fucking movie. Peter helped me out during a difficult time. You know, I didn't exactly have a picture perfect home life. I don't know if you'll remember this. Feels so distant. My dad wasn't around much, and when he was, he was around. Four of us were all together. We waited and waited for the fireworks. When things got bad, Peter and his aunt helped me out a lot. Probably more than they should have. They even let me stay with them for a few weeks. I don't owe you. Anything. I give you this place to stay. I give you money when you need it. The life of the party loses her spotlight and doesn't know what to do with herself. That's not true. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. This is totally the opposite of Spider-Man Blue because that shit actually built relationships up. Harry and Peter are not besties from the beginning. It's set up that after Peter Parker goes into the hospital to check up on Norman, but really he was sent there by the Bugle to take a picture, but he doesn't do it. And Harry doesn't know this, and he thinks that Pete's a good guy, and he invites him to his apartment to be a roommate. There's a build-up to the relationship between Gwen and Pete. There's tension between MJ and Gwen because of their mutual attraction to Peter Parker, just proving the ancient adage. There is a better Flash Thompson arc in Spider-Man Blue, because when Spider-Man saves Flash, Flash realizes that he's not really that well-adjusted and he has the man up and he joins the army. It's better than, oh, by the way, Peter saved me and um, he, he was he's a good guy, MJ, despite him shouting at you. 
And that's all we know about your relationship. Pro tip, if you are going to adapt Spider-Man Blue, motherfucking adapt Spider-Man Blue. Like the blueprint is there. So at this point, I noticed that there's a lot of dead air and there's a lot of shit that could be cut. Like here in the graveyard scene, I cut out a lot, but you get the idea quickly. This is my edit of the graveyard scene in the timeline. And this is the actual unaltered graveyard scene. It's so long. And in that span of time, the plot doesn't move. They're dancing around. It's like padding. I'm asking you why you're here. What do you want? So get to the point. Why are you here? You're worried about me. I'm trying to recall when I've ever seen you worry about anything. And there's a montage after Peter and Harry fight where Harry is walking around and after Peter is emo for a bit. Well, he's emo for most of the fucking movie. And just a segue, he cannot act. He's supposed to be crying here. But bro, where are the fucking tears, man? You could cut the scene of Harry and it would be fine. You could cut the scene of Peter crying. It would be fine. Like, it's too gratuitous. He's looking at the laptop with the USB and the videos. And I get it. He's sad. It keeps going on and on and on. Like in the room, Tommy feels unappreciated. His fiance is whoring herself behind his back to his best friend. She complains about Tommy slash Johnny. Repeat, that's the whole movie. So in Spider-Man Lotus, they repeat the formula, but the variables are just character is sad. So that's great. That is not to say there isn't any very human drama in any Spider-Man story, but you balance that out with wacky wahoo quips or badassery from Spider-Man. If you're lucky, it's both. The proportionality of the action scenes here is so minuscule. Like, I think the intro fight scene is what? Three minutes? Five minutes? There's also the fight scene with the goblin and this scene with the robber. Okay, fine, I'll count it even though it's not really a fight, but okay, whatever. Let's add that up. That is so minuscule compared to the whole fucking runtime of this movie. Maybe the fight scenes in the other Spider-Man movies are not as long as this, like proportional either. But there's such variety to Spider-Man. Lotus just focuses on Spider-Man and the negative emotions. So it's just a chore to watch the movie. Oh, the scene where he gets the robber and he retells his origin story. This is the part where the movie crosses boring to offensive. Hi, Tim. Nice to meet you. So this is the part of the movie where they adapt the kid who collects Spider-Man. It's about a super fan of Spider-Man who's very young. And for some reason, Spider-Man visits him. They hang out. <laughs> Even shows the kid his secret identity. And it turns out at the end of the comic, we see that Spider-Man visited a cancer institute and the kid only has a few months left to live. Something similar happens here. Uh, a letter was given by MJ and he visits the kid. But I realized something. This was what, one hour into the movie? It's too early for this. What do I mean? Usually when you have this like kid, you visit the kid and he's sick. What Spider-Man should do is inspire the kid to continue living or Spider-Man is inspired enough by the child to continue being a hero. And usually, why do you do that near the end of the film? Because it affirms his heroism. It affirms his journey. Despite failing, you should still keep fighting the good fight. That's what you do when you have a Spider-Man who's been depressed for most of the movie and he meets up a kid who loves him as a hero. What you don't do is fucking destroy their dreams. Look, I'm not the hero that you think I am. And in this, all of this, it's its not me. What about these droids? When you stop the whole Sinister Six by yourself? Or you stop the whole Brooklyn Bridge Tim, from collapse? these stories, they're just that, stories. They did this in the fucking movie. But you tried to save her. I saw the videos. The Beagles making up stories like they always do. It's not the same. There's more to it that you wouldn't understand. It's funny that he says this. But then he goes, never mind that, I'ma traumatize the child anyway. I think I might be able to help you understand it a little better. Spider-Man admits that 
it was his fault that his uncle died in the comic. But what he says to the kid is that it just helped him resolve to be a hero. He is down on himself, sure, but at the end of the day, he's still Spider-Man. He showed up for the kid. It doesn't happen here. In fact, it's quite the opposite. I was only looking out for number one, myself. The choices come with consequences. It could have been different. But there's no changing the past. I had to live with what I did. It was the greatest mistake of my life. Now everyone else is paying for it. That includes you now, cancer child. <laughs> and what's worse, it takes the mother of the child to tell him that what he's doing is wrong and you should be a hero. I told him what he needed to hear. He's better off. That little boy has looked up to you his entire life. No. He has watched you save thousands of people. Fucking. You were his hero. Shit. Please. Give him something to believe in. And then Spider-Man goes to the kid's room like a whipped boy and goes, I guess I'll be your hero, kid. What is this? I feel so strongly against this interpretation of Spider-Man. Like Spider-Man ending up in that situation? Bullshit. He would have gotten his head in the game or not showed up. Not this abomination. You cannot put this in your credits and put that scene in the same fucking movie. So not only is it boring, it's insultingly boring. I wish I would have proposed. And the ending is, uh, this is so poorly done. This whole thing is poorly done. If you're gonna adapt Spider-Man Blue and not do it correctly, at least here, what happens is Spider-Man visits the grave of Gwen. So what you could have done is just have Spider-Man narrate to Gwen everything that happened in the movie, right? You run into the camera, cue the inspirational music, you've learned something. Congratulations, Spider-Man. It's what you would have wanted. It's what Ben and your father would have wanted too. You don't have to do the tape recorder thing from Spider-Man Blue. This is a perfect ending. What the fuck is this? Hey, Pete. What? That's besides the point. Point is, my best friend. You've always been there for me. And I went and ran off when I should have been there for you. All of us. But I think we gave something too. Providing epilogues to characters I barely gave a fuck about? Amazing! And that's not it. That's not over yet. Because Spider Man does the wrap up thing again. Spider Man Lotus, everyone. Hooray. Despite negative reviews, a lot of people seem to have liked the movie. So good on the guy. I hope Gavin learns from this. I hope the creator learns from this because there are pacing problems. Some editing would really make this film better and a less asshole is Spider Man, also. But this movie was not a good movie, bro. <coughs> Spider Man, bogus. Spider Man, blotus. <laughs> if you made it to the end, thank you for watching. Thank you for struggling with me. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. If you didn't like this video, Please leave a dislike, tell me what's up with that. Or if you liked it, give it a like. Like, come on. It helps with the algorithm, bruh! <laughs> what I do not do here is ad reads. Not anymore. Because I want it to be like, um, just the ads in the beginning and the end, thanks to YouTube partnership. And I don't want the experience to be muddled in the middle. So here we go. And you can support me on Patreon if you want to do that. Once again, I thank my patrons for making this possible. Black Vulcan X, Bonof M. Yisod, Delatar T, Robot I, Shaped Like Bacon, Marcelo Oliveria, John Lemley, Registered Good Boy, Hyrtor S. Hyrtorson, Chet McMaster, and Tag586. 
as well as these other wonderful warriors. More events to come, so stay tuned. Thanks for watching, guys. I have been The Weekend Warrior, and I'll see you on the next one. Take care.